when you are writing objectives, you want to begin with the standards. So if you're thinking about what lesson and am I going to teach, you need to start by looking at the state standards so you know what you're supposed to be teaching. So first, I'm going to use math as the examples in this video. Choose the area of math that you're teaching, like operations and algebra or measurement and data. So go to the right section and then choose a grade level indicator, such as this is the first grade standards, operations and algebraic thinking and um, it's under section A, represent and solve problems involving addition and subtraction. And the standard reads, use addition of sub and subtraction within 20 to solve word problems involving situations of adding to, taking from, putting together, taking apart, and comparing with unknowns in all positions. For example, by using objects, drawings, and equations with the symbol for the unknown number to represent the problem. This is quite complex, so we're going to break it down a little bit. The first step is to break it down and really look at the standard and figure out what that means for your students. So the first thing you want to do is to determine the target behavior. What is the behavior that the students are going to be doing? And in this standard, it's going to be using addition and subtraction within 20 to solve word problems. That's what the students are going to be able to do. That's your target behavior. The rest of the standard kind of tells you how they do that. So the next step is to determine the conditions under which the behavior occurs. So how do they do that? How does this actually look like? What does this look like in the classroom? And notice that in this particular standard, they actually tell you that. Sometimes you have to determine that yourself, but in this standard, they tell you by using objects, drawings, and equations with the symbol for the unknown number to represent the problem. And then the third step in writing an objective is, determine, is to decide the criteria for success. So how are you gonna grade this, in other words? Um, we don't often talk about grading things in preschool or even kindergarten, but we do. In our head, we still have an idea of what we think a sort of on-level performance would look like. So pop, possible examples are 80% of the problems correct, or all of the problems attempted, or all of the operations are correct. I'm gonna show you more examples of this as we go through this video. Um, the criteria for success is not in the standard usually. Um, it's something that you have to decide for your students based on where they are within the school year. Remember that the standards are supposed to be achieved by the end of the school year. So it's okay for your students to not be successful at that standard in the beginning of the school year. You're just working on it. So you might have only 80% of the problems correct in, in September and maybe 90% in January and 100% by March. Or um, you could have them be doing more problems or you could have them do them with, with less uh, help from you. So your standard might have with support from an adult and then later we take away that support. So let's put these together. These are the three parts of your performance-based objective. You've got your target behavior, the condition under which it occurs, and the criteria, the criteria for success. Um, so another way of thinking about this is what do you want them to do, how do they do it, and how much or how well do they have to do it? The important thing to remember is that the what you want them to do must be an observable behavior you may not use the words understand or learn because um, we can't see children understand. We cannot uh, see them learn. We can't observe that. We have to infer it and we infer learning from behavior. So the target behavior must be a behavior that you can observe, that you can directly identify. So let's go to some examples. My first example is this same first grade standard, um, and it's use addition within, the target behavior is to use addition within 20 to solve word problems involving situations of putting together and taking apart and comparing. I cut that down a little bit. They're not gonna do everything. They're just gonna put together, take apart, and then compare them. And they're gonna do that by using objects to represent the unknown number. So I simplified the standard a little bit here. You don't have to pick everything in the standard. Um, some standards are more clear than others as to what you have to be doing. Um, and then your criteria for success. And right now I'm going to say 80% of 10 problems. So my objective then, when I write my objective, it will be students will be able to correctly solve 80% of 10 addition problems involving situations of putting together and taking apart and comparing 
by using objects to represent the problem. So there's my objective. Let's try another one. Let's go to preschool because you might be thinking, okay, I get that for first grade, but what does this look like in preschool? We're using the preschool standard 4.43, which is uh, geometry. Students will manipulate, compare, and discuss the attributes of three-dimensional shapes. The conditions under which that occurs is going to be by building with attribute blocks during small group time. So I'm gonna have my small group, I'm gonna get out a bin of attribute blocks, I'm gonna give them to the kids and let them manipulate them, compare them, and discuss them. I'm gonna prompt them, I'm gonna be there to help them and prompt them. And my criteria for success is for them to be actively engaged in comparing, discussing, and manipulating for 10 minutes. So here's my uh, criteria, uh, I'm sorry, here's my objective. Students will be actively engaged for 10 minutes in manipulating, comparing, and discussing the attributes of three-dimensional shapes by building with attribute blocks during small group time. Do you see how precise this is and how much information is there? When you read this, you know exactly what you have to do for your lesson now. If you create these objectives uh, effectively, it's really quite clear how to do the rest of the lesson. Let's try another one. This is going to be kindergarten. And the, um, the standard uh, is about classifying, sorting, and counting. So our target behavior will be students will classify and sort objects into categories and count the number of objects. So once they sort them, uh, then they're going to count. So uh, we're going to use a variety of small toy animals. So we're going to have farm animals, zoo animals, sea animals, dinosaurs, and they're going to classify and sort them first. And then they're going to count, well, how many dinosaurs do you have? Well, how many um, sea creatures do you have? And I'm going to set my criteria as being able to classify, sort, and count at least five different objects. So when I put this together in my uh, objective, it's going to be students will classify, sort, and count at least five different small animals. Let's do one more. Let's go to third grade. And um, the target behavior that we're going to use is that students will measure areas of shapes. And the way that they're going to do that, uh, we, they, they don't tell us this in the standard. Again, some of the standards are very clear on the, the um, conditions under which the behavior occurs. Others are not. So I've decided that I'm going to use graph paper. So they're going to count unit squares using graph paper. Um, so in other words, they'll have, um, they'll trace um, a square, a rectangle, a triangle. Um, again, the, the more um, able students might go with a triangle or some shapes that are not as easy to, to count. And um, my expectation is that they will get at least five shapes correct. So here's my objective. Students will correctly measure the areas of at least five shapes by counting unit squares on graph paper. Well, now here's what I want to show you as the magic. If you write your objectives like this, the three-part objective becomes the assessment. It's exactly the same. So when you are writing your lesson plans, the section where I ask you to put your assessment, you're going to write your objective again. It will be the exact same wording. You don't even have to change it. If you've written your objective correctly, it is your assessment. This is, this is called backwards uh, design, where we start with our assessment and that becomes the objective. So really what you've created is your assessment that then becomes the objective. So the assessment and the objective in a good lesson plan are exactly the same. They're exactly the same. You can use the exact same wording. You don't even have to change the wording. And then finally, this performance assessment, your objective, is the independent practice part of your lesson. So the lessons are going to look a little bit different in math than in literacy, um, but we're still going to be doing some guided hands-on exploratory practice and some modeling. And then at the end of the lesson, we're going to have children try it out on their own. And when they try it out on their own, what they should be trying out is what you put in your objective. So this objective is going to be written in the objective section, it's going to be written in the assessment section, and then it's going to be written in the independent practice session of your lesson. So you can see why writing lessons like this is so powerful and so helpful in thinking through what you need to do to have a standards-based lesson. So I hope this helps. Good luck with your lesson planning.